Uh, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Um, I would like to uh, bring you a version of an interview uh, that was done uh, by Our Planet FM, that's uh, Tim Lynch, uh, with uh, Heather Mary uh, Pennycock, uh, and the item was entitled are councils, local councils, applying UN agendas throughout New Zealand? Um, and I've taken the liberty to edit it slightly, just to highlight certain things that Heather Marie has uh, has said um, that I think it's important for people uh, to know. And um, and I'm putting this together, I learned of a a demonstration on Waiheke Island off the coast of Auckland where local Maori are protesting um, a marina which which they say is uh, destroying the um, uh, their local penguin and it shows absolutely brutal uh, police tactics. One of the demonstrators was hit and fell into into the water so this is showing uh, the power of the state being used against people who are fighting for their own uh, rights and and for you know for nature. So that this opposition that's coming from this group, agricultural action group, who's been holding meetings up and down of farmers up and down the country um, is uh, I don't think that it's just a whole lot of uh, rednecks who just want to, con to continue you know polluting uh, it's also people who are deeply concerned uh, about the environment and in my mind I just cannot countenance a international bureaucratic and technocratic revolution being carried out in the name of uh, of the environment of saving the planet, uh, when in fact actually they're protecting their own economic interests, and in fact, as will be seen here, uh, it involves uh, a land grab. So uh, have a listen uh, to my edited highlights and I also encourage that you to listen to the interview uh, as a whole because it's very, uh, it's very good. I mean there are things in there that uh, I find, I still find hard to, to, um, to you know, to accept. Um, but the general point I see absolutely, and I'm deeply concerned about it. Okay. Yes, there's people like Grant Robertson who walked out from the Magic Radio interview and said it's conspiracy theory, it's rubbish, and he conveniently forgot to point out that himself and Jacinda Ardern attended the World Economic Forum conference in Davos in 2019, subject the Great Reset. It puts the people at the heart of policy decisions. It's about building you know, a happy, healthy, prosperous New Zealand which everyone can benefit from. Togetherness is the core of our strategy to deliver well-being and recognises that the spheres of our lives, our environment, our people, our economy, are interconnected and interdependent. These same principles lie at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, I'm proud to present New Zealand's first voluntary national review on progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. So we should not be surprised that our politicians lie repeatedly to us. They are not transparent and they're never held accountable. They break promise after promise, they tell lie after lie and somehow they are immune to any kind of repercussion. And so it's very much our belief that we will not get any redress to the situation through the political system. Every party is in Parliament is party to the United Nations agenda. They're all on board. There may be a small handful of MPs who are lower down the pecking order who aren't aware, 
but we've got people who say things to sound like they are fighting for freedom, but it's just controlled opposition. All the political parties in power all are many sides of the same coin. They're all heading the same way. I've been watching for some days, and this is not unique to New Zealand, that in the midst of what is a global issue, as you would expect, there are a number of rumours that circulate. Uh, I am present on social media, I see it myself. Uh, I cannot go around and individually dismiss every single rumour I see on social media, as tempted as I might be. So instead I want to send a clear message to the New Zealand public. Um, we will share with you the most up-to-date information daily. You can trust us as a source of that information. Uh, you can also trust the Director General of Health and the Ministry of Health. For that information, do feel free to visit at any time to clarify any room you may hear, covid19.govt.nz. Otherwise, dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. We will had 250 people turned up to a talk in the Nelson area at Upper Muteri. And when we left, they formed a, a local group, which they called Tasman Land Stand, because for those people, the SNAs, the significant natural areas, is a big focus at the moment. Their council has just sent people out letters with big rings around huge areas of their land, saying this is now going to be designated an SNA, a significant natural area. Now, this may or may not include native bush or anything that you can recognise as needing protection. It can be some people had an area of gorse mapped off as an SNA. But what it is, it's a blatant land grab. Because once this land is designated SNA, you still pay rates on it, but you have to fence it off. You have to do the weed control, but you are not allowed to put stock on it or to use it. So people say, well, we need to protect special areas in New Zealand. Well, actually... People that I know are already using QE2 covenants, riparian planting, fencing off native bush. People are proud to conserve our environment here in New Zealand. There might be a very, very, very small minority of people who aren't playing by the rules and they definitely need to be addressed. But you don't blanket legislate the entire country no. and treat everybody like a criminal and cripple their viability on their farm. People are losing anywhere between 30% to 90% of their land use. Could you, Could you explain this? This is, this is shocking. How oh, it's absolutely shocking. And Northland recently actually went and had a, a quick talk at a locals meeting in Kaio in Northland a couple of weeks ago, and there has been 42% of the land in Northland has been claimed as SNA, 42%. There was plenty of people at that meeting who their entire piece of land, apart from the piece where their house actually was and one metre around their house, everything else they owned had been designated SNA. Now, can I, can I ask... Sanity. A, it is appears that way. Now, I know Kaio gets affected by floods sometimes when a cyclone comes down, they're not just saying, okay, because these waters, these areas get flooded, that wanting to... No, no. That's good. No, I'm no. clarifying that. And so what they're doing is there's also going to be more legislation due out in, I think it's July still, the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity. Now, in there, they're going to take the criteria for allocating SNAs and make it even more widespread. So now they're including mobile fauna. So, so for example, the native falcon... If they say a native falcon usually flies over your property and rests in your pine plantation, we're going to put a circle around your pine plantation and make it an SNA. It's just insanity. So once you take away this amount of land and people can't use it, can't harvest or plant or run stock on it, most of the time you're destroying the viability of their farm. And again, you start to go, well, this makes no sense. But it actually does make sense if you look at the big picture, where is this coming from? And, and for anybody who didn't hear our talk a month ago, we presented on there, part of the information we presented is that in August 2019, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was the keynote speaker at the Goalkeepers Conference 
and New York. Now, that's where the countries go and report on how well they're achieving the United Nations Agenda 21 2030. And she was the keynote speaker because she was very proud to stand up and announce that in New Zealand, she had already implemented all these agendas through all our legislation. So she had implemented it by August 2019. So this is not something that's coming at us. It's something already put into our legislation. And now we're seeing it beginning to come out into the public. Yes. So if you're just a lay person who looks up the Agenda 21 or it's been rewritten as 2030 now, then you could read those 17 sustainable development goals and think they sound wonderful. We're going to eradicate poverty and have equality and have a sustainable future, look after our environment. That all sounds good. But what you can do on our website, which is www.aag.org.nz, is go to the link where you download the fine print roading, irrigation, ski fields, golf courses, even the family unit is listed in their eyes as unsustainable and something they want to eradicate. So once you start to read the fine print, you start to go, well, my goodness, this is where our government is taking us. Then these insane legislations which cripple our agricultural sector actually start to make sense. And so it's quite important that people do do their own research because when they're listening to me saying things like this, if they haven't heard it before, it does sound quite crazy. And the government likes to call everybody who speaks opposite their narrative conspiracy theorists. Well, there is a conspiracy going on, but this is not theory. And on our website, we have the video of Jacinda making that speech. We have the link to the United Nations agenda document, which is a United Nations document, so it can't be denied. And... You get in and you look at what's happening and why. Now, you also mentioned the World Economic Forum. And so once you destroy the agricultural industry in New Zealand, our economy crashes. And we know from the advertising campaigns and the book written by Klaus Schwab, the chairman of the World Economic Forum, that they are going to use the COVID lockdown crisis and the ensuing economic devastation to drive this economic worldwide meltdown. And then they will offer both countries and individuals the opportunity to have their personal debt forgiven as long as you sign an agreement saying you will never again own any public property. (laughs) And again, this sounds crazy, but you can actually find we've got on our Facebook page an article printed in the Forbes magazine, just exactly this, the World Economic Forum, talking about running their advertising campaign that it's the year 2030. I have absolutely no privacy. I own nothing and I'm happy. That's what they have millennials on billboards and television adverts in Europe promoting at the moment. Yes, all I And, um, sorry, just to put that in perspective, if you go back and look at David Rockefeller paid the people who wrote the UN Agenda 21, and they say quite openly in himself in videos and speeches you'll still find on the internet that United Nations Agenda 21 is based on communist China We are moving towards the state controlling everything in New Zealand. There is a horrendous act of parliament called the Domestic Terrorism Act, which is going to be coming to force soon. And it actually gives New Zealand police unprecedented powers equal to those that were seen in Nazi Germany, where the police can, without a warrant, come turn up at your house search it, take anything they want, arrest you on suspicion of you're going to be anti-government or say something harmful to the public, i.e. anything other than the government narrative only source of truth. Now, you don't only have to have done something for them to think that, but they can also take that course of action based on the premise that looking at your behaviour or the Facebook pages you frequent or your comments or whatever, that you could be a future danger to national security. So when that comes in, we're going to see Paul just taken on a whim or the good old 0800 Dob and your mates phone line, people phoning in and making complaints and people just being able to be picked up by the police, held indefinitely without representation. It's a very scary piece of legislation to read. And I do just need to give our listeners a heads up. We've been given some information that once that Domestic Terrorism Act becomes live, becomes in force, that anybody who uses the word sovereign to describe themselves or in their posts or whatever talks about sovereignty, 
will be viewed as anti-government and will come under big scrutiny by those people because they view it as someone saying, I'm sovereign, I'm above the government, therefore it's anti-government, therefore it's viewed as domestic terrorism. So a big heads up to people. If you're using the word sovereign or sovereignty, I would be thinking very hard about changing my language if I was you because that will be a red flag. In New Zealand, we've been aware of this thing called incrementalism and then or it's progressive little by little bit by bit and creep and this is what's happening we've been losing our freedoms over the last 30 years we see this crimp coming more and more and more and so consequently i'm very very keen to make sure that new zealanders get to know what's going on because it's imperative we're having to draw battle lines at the moment aren't we heather mary Yes, we are. And it's like, as you say, incrementalism, boiling the frog. He doesn't even realise he's being boiled because the temperature increases ever so slowly. And there's interviews of people who survived Nazi Germany who say, you know, if if everything happened all at once, we would have stood up and fought it. But it happened tiny law change by tiny laws change. People's freedoms were removed. Yes, we have people like Grant Robertson who walked out from the Magic Radio interview and said it's conspiracy theory, it's rubbish, and he conveniently forgot to point out that himself and Jacinda Ardern attended the World Economic Forum conference in Davos in 2019, subject the Great Reset. So we should not be surprised that our politicians lie repeatedly to us. They are not transparent and they're never held accountable. They break promise after promise, they tell lie after lie, and somehow they are immune to any kind of repercussion. And so it's very much our belief that we will not get any redress to the situation through the political system. Every party is in Parliament is party to the United Nations agenda. They're all on board. There may be a small handful of MPs who are lower down the pecking order who aren't aware But we've got people who say things to sound like they are fighting for freedom, but it's just controlled opposition. All the political parties in power, all are many sides of the same coin. They're all heading the same way. And the other thing people sometimes say to us is that, oh, well, the UN agenda, yes, New Zealand signed it. It's signed, by the way, in 1992 with 192 other countries have also signed it. So things are happening in New Zealand are happening in lockstep around the world too. But people say, oh, it's non-binding. Well, if you check with the top lawyers in New Zealand, we've checked with them. If your contract says this is non-binding, the moment you put your signature on it, it becomes binding. So it's one of those double speaks. And I would highly recommend everybody either looks at an online legal dictionary or buys one because you will find consistently the words being used by the government in their acts, in their legislations, have a double meaning. A person is not a people person as we know it. It's a corporate entity. And you mentioned that the government is a corporation. So the government of New Zealand, the Crown, is Her Majesty the Queen and Right of New Zealand. It's a company on the US Securities Exchange. And so we are being... We don't have a lot of elected people who are looking after our best interests. We have a corporation who are taking their instructions from the UN agenda, which is a global elite group who are working for global governance and heading towards the Chinese communist system. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in New Zealand. A lot of foreigners who now live in New Zealand, they turn up at our meetings and say, can Kiwis not see? This is communism 101. They're following the same playbook. And look at Stalin. What did he do? He targeted the farmers first, removed their firearms, put them out of business and forced them off the land because they are self-sufficient, they can provide food for other people, they quite often have firearms, they have a fighting spirit. If you've got townsfolk, as soon as you turn off the electricity, the water and empty the food from the supermarket, people will buckle under pretty fast. But your farmers are pretty self-sufficient and that's where the resistance will come from. So communism take over 101 first hammer the farmers. So if we look at the entire methane emissions from the entire world and say, okay, that equals one Olympic-sized swimming pool worth of methane, which would be 250 million litres, that's the entire world production. How much of that is produced by New Zealand's ruminants, by our dairy cows? 
it would equal six mils, which is one overflowing teaspoon out of 250 million litres. And yet our government is going to crucify and smash our dairy industry for the sake of one teaspoon worth out of 250 million litres of the total world emissions. Again, if you look at our government faulty science and, and supposedly telling us we produce 80 million metric tonnes of carbon emissions a year, sounds like a lot, it's actually false, but if you say it, perhaps it's true, let's look at China. In one week alone, China produces 269 million metric tonnes in one week. So if you took away all our supposed carbon emissions for New Zealand, it equals one third of one week of one country emissions and it's less than one percent of the world's total emissions and as I've said if you include grasslands and scrublands New Zealand is carbon negative and there was a scientist I was speaking to a few months ago who'd done a complicated equation where he included the crops we grow as well in New Zealand how many months they're what size how much carbon they sequester because he wanted to know what we should be paid in carbon credits because he knew New Zealand is carbon negative and he worked out we should be receiving $1.2 billion in carbon credits a year. Instead, the government narrative, remember the government is the only source of truth, Yes, is telling us we're producing 80 million metric tonnes. They're doing things like from 2030 banning the introduction of machinery which runs on fossil fuels. Now, you imagine if you're a, a farmer or a horticulturist and you need tractors and harvesters and everything else, no, those big machines work well on fossil fuel and they've, no, no, everything will be being phased out and you'll be able to get electric tractors. Each tractor will have a 10-ton battery. One 10-ton battery per tractor. How do you it doesn't take work. it out, charge it? Yep, it doesn't. And we can't produce enough electricity even to supply one electric car per household in New Zealand. How are you going to electrically power diggers, graders, bulldozers, well, actually, under the UN agenda, they intend there to be no private motor vehicles, nobody living on the land. There'll be human exclusive zones, wilderness zones. They want us living in the city in high rise, rabbit hutch types apartments. And if you drill down into that 352 page document, you see it. And well, mainly they're here just exploding because they can't figure out why the government is just targeting them on so many levels and smashing them, they all know that the agricultural sector is what's producing their GDP and that's what's paying the interest on the debt. Pre-COVID, we owed between 600 and 700 billion dollars in this country. So your interest alone for that is 46 billion dollars a and year. Yeah. And that was the GDP for the ag sector in that year, which ended just before the COVID lockdown. So basically tourism's not bringing us any revenue. What's paying the interest on our loans, 80% of which are owed to the CCP? Why would the government be smashing the farming industry? Well, the answer is that the government is following the UN agenda, which is aligned with the World Economic Forum, and they are pushing this country into economic collapse so that we will be offered that agreement, sign away your right to own anything with the state then owns you and... and etc where they tell us what their plans are for us and there seems to be some kind of weird moral code not that they really have morals that they have to tell us what they're going to do before they do it it's all hidden in plain sight and if we say and do nothing that is consent silence is consent One thing I did just want to talk a little bit more about, Tim, because a lot of the farmers are just very upset about the significant natural areas, the land grabs. And the first step is refuse to let people onto your land to do a survey and refuse to fill out the survey form they send you or respond. What they're doing is they're sending maps to farmers with incorrect boundaries and things and saying, please respond if your boundaries are incorrect or et cetera. Now, the crucial thing to remember here is that as soon as you respond to the letter or fill in the survey, you've recontracted with them. Yes. Now, we mentioned that the government is a corporate. All its agencies, be it the police, WINS, the Ministry of Justice, the court system, etc., they're all corporations as well. And fundamentally, under their own laws, a corporation has no jurisdiction over a living man or woman only over other corporations. And if you look at every single act that's been written, they all begin, this act binds the Crown. 
not living men and women. This act binds the Crown. The Crown is corporation. Why do we think that applies to us? Because, A, we've been conditioned and indoctrinated that the law applies to us. And they use the word person, which look that up in the legal dictionary. It's not a living man or woman. But we are turned into a corporation and Crown ownership when we are registered at birth under our capital surnames and we make a Crown entity based on our surname and our Christian names. Now, every time we fill in a form with our legal name, being our Christian and surnames, our date of birth and our physical address, and you get asked those questions, whether you're phoning the bank or phoning the electricity company or whomever, so your three security questions, when you answer to that legal identification, you are identifying yourself as your dead corporate entity, the entity that's been created from your name. Right. So when you identify as that name, you become a corporation and they have jurisdiction and authority over you. They've got you. So, yeah, so anything, because once you become aware that the government is a corporation, that they get us to contract with them fraudulently so that we identify as a corporation as well, which gives them jurisdiction and authority over us, then you understand that you can choose to stand as a living man or woman which a corporation does not have authority over, and you can turn your back on that fraudulent system. They've been saying how Jacinda is talking about people who own utes. They're putting in a new tax, which will be up to $6,000 if you buy a new ute truck. Well, if you're a farmer or an agricultural trades person or a trades person in town, a plumber, a painter, whatever you're probably going to need a ute to carry your stuff around, but they're saying this group of people who buy utes are, really don't need them. It's an illegitimate use of a vehicle, so we're adding a $6,000 tax on anybody who buys a new ute. I mean, since when did the government tell you what vehicle you could own and why? If you've earned enough money to buy a truck and you believe you need it, whether you want a four-wheel drive in the weekend or tow a boat or you need it for your actual work, that's your prerogative. If you've earned the money, you spend it on what you want. Since when can the government tell us what vehicle we should drive? And if we're driving one they don't like, they're going to tax us $6,000. They're not taxing the people on the Land Rovers or the people with the V8 engines. They're taxing people who basically service the agricultural industry or who are tradies. Why would you do that? Because you're trying to expedite the crashing of the economy. None of the ridiculous legislation they're passing makes sense unless you go back to the root cause. Look in that agenda and they're aiming to eradicate the agricultural industry. Yes, the countries um, in the world are in lockstep. As I say, there was 192 that signed that UN agenda. And one of their best ways of controlling the people is food and water shortages and energy, of course. And I have a friend who has family still in India, and she sent me some videos. And what's happening in India at the moment is the Defence Force is burning crops of field and burning depots which hold food. They are having severe food shortages. There's people starving already. And so it's definitely one of their prime tactics for subjugating people is shortages of food, shortages of water. And, of course, if you look here in New Zealand, as they're phasing out all gas and coal, electricity generation, etc., they've said openly they're expecting energy shortages. You know, they've shut down Marsden Point. Yes. It already takes weeks, if ever, to be able to import goods into New Zealand. So as soon as, as our fuel supplies stop coming in, then we are totally shut down. It seems, it's, yeah. It's, you've got to look big picture and it's just, you see... It's resource after resource taken away so that we cannot be self-sufficient and hammering the farmers, hammering the food, that will certainly impact, particularly if you look at our major cities, are the main population base. You bring the city people under control by cutting off their food. You're already three quarters of the way there, aren't you? Well, the Labor government got 100, 100 or 110 armoured cars about... 10, 12 years ago, very flash Canadian armoured cars, they've been sitting in, in mothballs all this time. They're not being used. And so it's a big question, what's going on there as well? Yes, why would you think you need one of those? Another interesting thing too, Tim, to have a look at is if you get on the internet and you look up UNANZ, so that's the United Nations Association of New Zealand, 
and you will find that what they're doing is setting up regional offices all over New Zealand. I think there might be nine already. I believe there's supposed to be 12. Why are you setting up 12 UN regional offices all over New Zealand unless you're planning for the UN to be in charge here? Yes, that's a very interesting one. Now, can I also just quickly mention, it's really important at the moment, we cannot have our air contaminated or our water contaminated or our soil contaminated because we've got to stop also spraying chemicals, period, because we've got to liberate the food chain from contamination so we can have healthy bodies and healthy minds. And this is really important. This is why for many, many years now, 10 years, have pushed regenerative or biological agriculture if we can make sure that the farmers actually have the most healthiest food, because if you have biological and regenerative agriculture, the soil bacteria start to grow and expand, and it's really, really healthy for the soil, and you get healthy plants, you get healthy produce, etc. And also in your gut, in your intestines, it helps yep. you to have healthy, healthy biomes inside ourselves. We have to have these organisms, uh, microorganisms to break down our food and so that we extract all the energy from the food we take. So it's important that we have no GE. GE is definitely what they're endeavouring to sneak through all the time into this country. I've been in major battles to make sure that Northland in particular is a genetic engineering free zone and no glyphosate. And dear farmers and listeners, if you see a paddock anywhere in New Zealand that seems to be very, very orange, they have sprayed that with glyphosate and they will spray that and within four days they will allow cows to come in and eat whatever's there because usually they'll spray a paddock so that they can get rid of all growth so that they can put in a new crop, be it potatoes or be it pumpkins or whatever. But these orange paddocks, when the cow eats that, the orange leaf, they are taking in glyphosate and when overseas they find out that all the baby formula and the, and the milk powder that we're sending overseas, the butter, the cheese, etc., has got glyphosate, the world market will say, New Zealand, you're off limits, you've spoiled the food. This is and what it is is that the Federation Farmers, they're not doing anything about it, where once upon a time they had organic farmers who were the president or chairman of the federated farmers no more they've been infiltrated just like shall we say fonterra fonterra could have new zealand be the greatest organic producer of butter milk and milk powder and what's happened they too have they've bought in to the corporate game the government game and they're all captured Yes, and just to make the point that there are some good people left in Thank you. Federated Farmers and Beef and Land and Dairy NZ, but from the executive level where the direction comes from, they are totally in bed with the government. Said all those adv supposed advocacy groups are in the tent with the government, and when you're already in the tent with the government, may have been in the bed, then you are not advocating for the farmers. There was a recent mainstream media article with Andrew, the president of Fed Farmers, saying, read very much that he was saying, yes, Federated Farmers agreed with the government that these 17 sustainable development goals needed to be implemented across the country. I mean, it's so blatant now that in councils, community plans, etc., they've got the UN logo all over it. They've got the 17 sustainable development goals. And, of course, they've indoctrinated their use that dairy farmers are poisoning the planet, that farming's dirty, that everybody needs to eat grasshoppers and have an electric car. But you do the, the math, do the research, posted a, a great video on our Facebook page the other day which shows that the environmental cost of the batteries of the electric cars, the fact that you can't recycle them, the fact that children in Africa are sent into mines and, and worked like slaves to get the Rare, rare metals that yep. you need to create them. You know, it's all a farce. It's a total farce. And we're just bombarded 20 hours a day on social media and through the 6 o'clock news in our newspapers with a stream of propaganda. It's not truth. I just did an interview two weeks ago with Scott McIndoe of Legacy talking about what's happening in the New Zealand waters and he said look we are in a critical situation there's only snapper 
really now because mm. that's the only pugnacious fish that can live here. And because we have a small population, it hasn't been all taken out of the water. But he said, I want to see from high tide to low tide a rahui, which is a, a time of rest or fallow for mm-hmm. five years. No pippies, no mussels, nothing off that beach at all. He said, let it rest, let it recuperate. And I see people with nets all up and down the place where I live, and they're taking, 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 taking all the time. I can see six lots of people with nets on the beach in one day. Wow. And they're unconscious. See, they've got no connection wow. where once upon a time yeah. a farmer could stand on his land and, and, and he could feel the wind, he could smell the, the fragrances of different flowers in the orchard or something like that. He knew from the cows how they were mooing. If they didn't moo, usually they're yep. busy eating. But they will moo loudly if they're standing in a paddock full of just mud and stubble because they're hungry. We have to uh, yep. be able to be aware of change of the seasons and, and the temperature and the barometer and all that sort of thing to make sure that we care for our land because it's a great honour to be able to have some land and nurture it and steward it for future generations. I wish to emphasise that we as an individual, a family, community, region and as a country can rise to the occasion of a heartfelt, unifying spirit of cooperation. We are now starkly realising that there's a stealthy, global control game being enacted to lock us down as a humanity. But over the last few decades, we have been dumbed down by the media and an educational system that teaches us not to question or to be curious and to wonder. All you have to do is listen to the inane news every hour on all the talkback and musical stations. Three minutes of drivel, as the saying goes. This can be seen with mainstream media, with the younger generation not reading a newspaper, be it local or national, or watching the news at TV1, TV3, Parrot, virtually the same continuous rhetoric. We have found ourselves drowning in the same semi-censored swamp of sameness, with a media that takes its feeds from overseas that are all multinational corporations pushing the same agenda. The churches have failed us too, Christianity has taken a hit in this country, just like other Western countries, because they virtually bored people to death and failed to call a halt to corrupt practices and stand up for justice. Sadly, you can see this today with near vacant churches across the country. Yet from most religious accounts, we are spiritual beings having an earth experience, that we are far more than we ever thought possible. Huge numbers of people globally have had out-of-the-body or near-death experiences where they have found themselves outside their body looking down on it, in many cases seeing doctors frantically working to keep their body alive. GreenPanetFM.com has done a number of interviews based on this and what is the soul. Note that over the last 70 years, universities and educational institutes have been swayed to believe that the universe is a fluke of existence, that God does not exist, nor does the soul, and consequently they have done away with anything metaphysical or spiritual. Yet there are more and more people having mystical experiences, and there is a fast-growing body of evidence realizing that we live after death, and that our body is in fact a temple, which we need to cherish with fresh air, pure water and an organic food chain, plus as family and friends experience love, laughter and joy. Thank you. Decide to network. Use every letter you write, every conversation you have, every meeting you attend, every email you send and remember even Facebook. To tweet and to express your fundamental beliefs and dreams. Affirm to others the vision of the world you want. Network through thought. Network through action. Network through love. Network through the spirit. You are the center of a network. You are the center of the world. You are a free, immensely powerful source of life and goodness. 
Affirm it. Spread it. Radiate it. Think day and night about it, and you will see a miracle happen. The greatness of your own life in a world of big powers, media and monopolies. But of 7.8 billion individuals, networking is the new freedom, the new democracy, a new transparency, and a new form of wholeness and happiness.